Sarah, welcome to the Astro Ben podcast. How are you? Doing well today. Thank you. Good. Fantastic. Um, the first thing I noticed uh, when you came online was the uh, the blackboard behind you, which uh, makes me very happy because every time you see a, a scientist in a, a film uh, trying to uh, discover exo ex uh, exoplanets, they're always scrawling on a blackboard. Um, so how uh, have you always done that? Have you always kind of does that make sense to you, that huge blackboard and uh, is that something that you still do? It does, still yeah. Do? It's particularly mm. useful for working things out with students or having a conversation. It's a very useful tool for that. I have a, um, yeah, I know you let it out. That's my view. It's kind so of where foggy here today. That's Boston. Yeah, of course. Well, You're right now I'm MIT. in my office at MIT, which is uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. But right across the river is the city of Boston. And so from my office, we're on the 17th floor. It's kind of really a higher floor because they skipped a few floors at the beginning, but it's a very rainy, foggy day. You can't see the top of the buildings over there. Yeah, and then it's... on the other side of my office, I have a, let's give you this brief tour. That's um, a floor to ceiling chalkboard, a little neater. Nice. And then on this side, I have, um... maybe that's for later in the conversation. You have to. Guess what spot. that is? You'll you can guess what that is, yeah. Yeah, I have no idea. To me, that Just looks like some sort of uh, canoe case or something, but I'm sure it's. Uh, right. It looks. So oh wow! Okay. I will. T I will send a screenshot of this, this so, uh, so people can see. This is a uh, one percent scale model of a giant, specially shaped screen called Starshade. And yes. the goal for this is to fly in outer space with its own spacecraft. And it would formation fly with a space telescope to block out starlight so we can search for planets like Earth. Do you want to guess what the big thing is on my wall right now? This is 1% model here. It's a, a slightly bigger model. <laughs> that is... I've, I, I have no idea. That's I'm right. Just... That is a... It's... It is. It is a full scale model of one single petal. Wow. So tell me so about the So you can see how big it is. Why don't we, why, let's go straight in with the well, Starshade star projects shade. then. Tell me about it. Sure. Well, Starshade, well, okay. I mean, you're in a, you have the Astro Ben podcast, so you know how popular astronomy is. And one of the main goals we have is to find another planet like Earth, to be able to go to a dark sky and to show our friends and our children or nieces and nephews and point to a star and say that star has a planet like Earth. But our Earth is so hard to find, right? Because it's so small. It feels big when we're on it because traveling takes forever, but it's tiny compared to the star and we can't, we have a problem because the star is so bright. And to be able to find a true Earth twin, we think the best way is to go to space above the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere and to block out the starlight so we can see the planet directly. And Starshade is one of a few different ideas of how to get that job done. Wow, Think of so it just... like, you know, when the sun is blinding, you put your hand in front of the bright sun or a bright light, and you can kind of see a bit better. So on Earth, so that would block out the sunlight on Earth? Well, this Starshade is to go up in space and block out a star, another star. I see. So that okay. we can search for any planets orbiting that other star. Wow. That's pretty mind blowing. Yeah. Let's well, back up a bit. I mean, think about our, let's imagine we wanted to find a twin of our planet Earth with the same type of host star. And imagine those are like out in space somewhere. Well, that Earth would be 10 billion times fainter than its host star. 10 billion. Mm, mm. And we have no detectors that can handle that dynamic range. So the only way solution we have is to block out the starlight, to literally block out the glare of the star so we can see any planets orbiting around it. So you might have potentially hundreds of those blocking out certain areas of the sky so you can focus on a certain ex exoplanet or a certain area of the, of the stars that you want to focus on. Yes, well, we would have just one star shade, 
but it would take turns looking at different stars. So the star shade could block out light of one star and we would see a planet, maybe stay there for a month, get yeah. more data on the planet, or maybe there's no planet there. And then the star shade would have to move across the sky to retarget, to line up with the space telescope to retarget for another star. That's so cool. Well, let's, let's, let's take a step back, as you say, and uh, think about exoplanets, because we, how would you describe them? Because I've always thought they're like Earth-like planets that orbit another star that isn't our sun. Um, how would you how would you define an exoplanet? Is it an Earth 2.0, well, as you just said? <laughs> yeah, I would agree with half of what you've said, <laughs> in that an exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star other than the sun. Mm. But what astronomers have found is that, wow, none of the systems out there are like our, our solar system. And we have found so many crazy planets out there, they almost defy imagination. So it's not just about an Earth 2.0, which is very, very hard to find. Right now, it's mostly about other types of planets, like big, hot Jupiters. People find planets so close to their star that the time it takes to orbit the star is less than one day. So those planets, their year, the time it takes to go around the star is literally like 12 hours. And some of these planets are so hot because they're very close to the star and the star's heating them like crazy. Hmm. So, I mean, I could just go on for like ever no, about I, all I, the different types of planets. I, I, lo I love just, it. Wow. I, I love it. Um, w when was the first exoplanet detected? Because it, it seems to be sort of only relatively recently that we've had the technology to uh, to, to 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 confirm they, they're there and, and see them. Um, sort of a few decades ago. Well, it depends. Yeah. I mean, it's been about, I'd say, 25 years or so. The first exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star was announced in 1995. Mm. So, but it took a while for the field of exoplanet research to really take off. Because at first there were just a few planets and no one really believed they were planets. And it took a while for our instruments and software to get better and better to find more and more planets. And, and as of today in 2022, how many exoplanets do you think there are and and i'm not talking about your equation because i want to come on to that later but is there a is there a number because i imagine it's quite big sure the number is around five thousand. we know of oh. around five thousand exoplanets today but those are only the ones we can find we think every star has we think there's evidence that every star has multiple planets so there's a hun hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. If we could search each of those, which we can't by any means, just think of how many planets that would be. Trillions. There's probably trillions of planets in our galaxy. It's crazy. Do you, do you remember how old you were when you um, made the decision to pursue a career chasing exoplanets? Because it's it, it seems such a... Uh, a crazy thing to uh, to chase like how did you fall into it well now i'm gonna date myself but i was probably uh, let me think in my early to mid 20s because i was a graduate student at harvard university in the mid 1990s and i had finished what's like a master's degree and i was setting out to do my phd but my master's degree was a bit of a dead end. I finished the project and it didn't have a big future. And just as I was trying to figure out what to do, the new exoplanets were discovered. And my thesis advisor suggested I work on these new planets. I don't know if it was really a conscious decision in a way because it was so sketchy at the time, very sketchy. And it just kind of took off from there. When you say sketchy, what do you mean? As in the science was so new and uh, it, it wasn't a, a career path that was sort of commonly, well, it didn't, it didn't exist. So did, did you mean you kind of fell it into didn't it? didn't exist. So two things I would say. Mm. One is the huge skepticism that people hadn't discovered exoplanets, but had found a new type of, let's say, variability in the host star. Because remember, the planets are so small, even a Jupiter mass or Jupiter-sized planet compared to the star and mostly we were using indirect techniques. So 
in this case, just to go into a bit more detail, it's the planet and star, you know, the planet's orbiting the star, but you'd more accurately say the planet and star are orbiting their common center of mass. And the result of that planet orbiting the star is the star wobbles, the star's moving around. And that was the way people discovered planets back then. But is it really a planet or is the star wobbling for some other reason, like pulsations or other variability that we know stars have? Hmm. So one of the reasons it was sketchy was there was a big pushback that perhaps it was a brand new kind of variability or it was some kind of error. And then the second group, the second reason was if people believed that it was a new field, they didn't see it going anywhere because of this huge difference between planet and star sizes and masses and the fact that the star is right there and so big and bright. Mm. They didn't think we could find, you know, a huge, you know, they thought the field was going to just kind of stall out. And I guess part of it is because, you know, say you could detect them, they're so inconceivably far away that there isn't a, you know, we'll come on to whether there are sort of, you know, possible ways of getting there, but especially, you know, 20 years ago, it just seems so sort of out there. And, uh, you know, I, I imagine trying to get um, funding and things like that, it's difficult to justify any, uh, you know, useful applications on Earth. Um, in, well, it's it's sort of difficult, I imagine. Um, difficult, how, yes, definitely. How, how, how unique is our Earth? Um, you say there's sort of about 5,000 exoplanets in the uh, habitable zone. Um, but how many places are there, do you think, in the universe that could support human life as we know it? I'm sure you've been asked this question before. So wow, what a great question. Yeah, a great question. <laughs> a great question. You know, I wish we had an answer for you. We don't have an answer. We don't know how common other Earths are. Other Earths are very hard to find. Some people extrapolate based on data we do have and want to say that something like one in five sun-like stars has a planet like Earth. People want to say that. That's very, you know, very specific statement. And it's not even that. They'll say... Star, uh, one in five sun-like stars has a planet, a rocky planet, that's in the so-called habitable zone of the host star. But if that's correct, then there's a lot of potential planets out there, but we don't know anything about those planets. Have you seen the movie Interstellar? It's my favorite film. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, it's... Uh it's people who listen to this podcast will know i try not to why well, i the first few episodes i couldn't stop bringing up interstellar um so yeah you're probably the best person to bring it up too but um i love everything about right, okay. it okay well yeah okay well here's the thing mm -hmm. think about interstellar they knew there were three potentially habitable planets right but they didn't know enough about them they had to go there and see the details remember there was the one planet that had that poisonous gas yeah well it's like that like even if we could find these supposedly one in five sun-like stars that has a potentially habitable planet, we could study the atmosphere. We could learn about its gross characteristics, but that could support human life. We wouldn't really know. We couldn't find that out from far away, just like in the movie, you know, they couldn't, they didn't know from far away, which was going to yeah. be the one. Yeah. So they had to send probes there. And then, I, yeah. So I, so I guess it's, I mean, when is it, is it always going to be an unknown until we can send, uh, you know, robots and humans or, or a combination of the two to to confirm? Or, or do you think we'll get to the point where telescopes develop so much where we can, you know, get enough data to make a, a you know, reasonable estimation that it's um, a habitable world? Yes, I don't think we'll have to send robots and humans, but we will have to do something pretty drastic. There are two ideas I can run by you. One of them involves sending a telescope to 500 times the Earth-Sun distance. It's called the Solar Gravitational Lens Telescope. And people want to use our sun. It's kind of complicated, but they want to use our sun as a giant magnifying glass. And if you could line up your telescope really far away with that sun, you know, right lined up with a planet you know about, and you do this right, and we don't know for sure if this can be done, then you could magnify the planet to something like, seeing something like a 10 kilometer resolution on the surface. What? 
Yes, there's an idea for this. So if you could do that, what planet would you line it up with? That's the question. Well, that's a good question. We need a lot more groundwork before we can choose a planet. We'd like to do more work in advance. We don't really have, I mean, that would be a lot to put on and we'd hope to get more than one of these telescopes because each one would have to be in a different position to line up with our sun and the background planet. Well, there's one planet around Proxima Centauri, our very nearest star, Proxima Centauri. And people think there's an Earth mass planet in the so-called habitable zone. So I'd probably pick that. That would be our best one. Yep. So Is the that... second method. Yeah. No, carry on the second method. No, yeah. go ahead. No, no, no you go ahead because you wanted to. Follow. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just. Uh, so, so Alpha Centauri, that's kind of um, uh, the one that everyone knows about is what why is that so uh so potentially interesting is it are there certain factors about that that makes it uh uh more than likely that it could be a good you know starting point for us i know it's been uh you know it's it, the focus has been on it for a while what what about it makes it so special well it's just that proxima centauri it's the closest star to earth and the, it re does relate to what i was about to say about the second mm. method is the idea of sending a probe or probe sending up thousands of little tiny space chips, little chips that will deploy a solar sail and accelerating these sails using a giant bank of ground-based lasers, accelerating these sails to travel very fast, like at a, like very fast. And they would still take a long time, like 20 years to get to the nearest star system but they would kind of zoom by, snap some photos and send those photos back to earth. And 20 so years doesn't sound If you want to consume It doesn't, but we're not we're still maybe <laughs> at least 20 years away from from getting this done. So imagine that. But that would be fantastic. But think about that for a moment. The nearest star would take 20 years to get there with this fanciful technology. So a star twice as far away that would take 40 years. So the reason we love Proxima Centauri so much is just because of its, it's very far away, but it's the closest star to our system. Um, absolutely. And what, what te technological, uh, uh, what, what technologically speaking, what needs to be done so that we could even, you know, aspire to get there in those timelines? Um, so many things. Yeah. This idea, in case, in case you want to look this idea up, it's called Starshot. And Starshot has a number, of pro a number of major, major challenges. One is developing the material for these sails that's very light, but that when the lasers hit them to accelerate them, that the lasers won't destroy the material. Another challenge is getting the land, like a square kilometer, and putting all these telescopes to send up a laser lasers, you know, that would be equivalent to something like 10 gigawatts of power. So one gigawatt is um, 10 to the nine. So if you have a light bulb, that's okay, we got to let's see if we can said one. Um, it's something like having, you know, a billion light bulbs, like so much power in one location. And there's a lot of other challenges as well. Yes, mm. but you have to start somewhere. Completely. Well, I, I wanted to uh, uh, to find out a bit about. Um, I read. Uh, I was doing a bit of research on uh, on yourself, and um, I, I read that as part of uh, uh, one of your birthday celebrations, you organised a, a party at MIT, and uh, you invited uh, your some of your very clever friends and scientists and former astronauts, and and said to them that you wanted one present. And that was uh, to help plot a winning strategy to find another Earth, um, which I, I find that incredibly inspiring. Um, how, how do people react when you say, uh, you know, you set a goal like that? Because I imagine a lot of people are interested in in helping, but it's just such an out there thing. You know, how do people get in? How do, how do people how do people react when you tell them you want to find another Earth? Well, the people that the kind of people you're referring to, my friends and colleagues, most of them love this idea. I think throughout history, you know, 
astronomy has been apparently a part of every culture and people have always wondered about the stars and people love it. However, it's so complicated and very complication means expensive. And it's not clear that the whole rest of the astronomy community is on board with this idea because everyone has their own things they love. Absolutely. So I think we're going to get there eventually. I just, I don't know when, but the momentum is certainly going in that direction. What are you, what are you doing currently at the moment? Like, have you, have you sort of got a long-term well, strategy? Like it's like a 10 year plan. And like this year you're focusing on, on this part is, is there kind of a, a grand plan or do I'd love to hear kind of what your day to day is. Um, yeah. And how you I think that's works. such a great question because we could ask the same of you even, or of each other. Mm. There's a bit of both, you know, there's some long-term planning, but some things are also out of our control in both bad and good ways. Like here in the United States of America, every decade, the astronomy community gets together and makes a priority rank ordered list of what should be the next big mission that NASA should fund. And I was not on this committee. I was conflicted out because of my involvement in Starshade. I couldn't be on the committee because I was such a proponent of it. And this committee got together and, and they actually did recommend as the number one, a space telescope, a new sophisticated space telescope to go to space to find another Earth. Uh, they didn't specifically endorse Starshade. There are other ways to do this. But they said, we're not ready for it now. We have to invest in more technology and envision this telescope being ready in the 2030s or later. And everything that, yes, everything, you can just sort of do the math and think of how old you'll be. And then I can think of how old I will be. And then think that usually things take about 10 more years. Mm. So what if this telescope launches in the 2040s? That's still good, but it means that maybe I should be doing something else right now. Yeah. Right. I should be trying to find another way to find an earth. So I do have a couple other projects going um, in that regard. And I'm going to tell you about one of them briefly. And then I'm going to tell you about my favorite project right now. Okay. So just wait there for one second because I've got to grab another pro thing. So. So um, around 15 or tw around 15 or 20 years ago, we had a similar thing happening. We had a plan to find another earth. It was called Terrestrial Planet Finder. And Terrestrial Planet Finder was being funded at $50 million a year just to get it going. And then someone pulled the, pl pulled the plug and Terrestrial Planet Finder was basically canceled. So I came up with another idea to find another Earth if it exists around a very bright star. And if another Earth is out there and it happens to be aligned just so, and it's transiting the star, it's going in front of the star as seen from our view, it would be amazing if we could detect one of those. So the, what I thought of was, you know, one telescope can't look at the whole sky at one time for a long period of time. So I imagined a program where we have a constellation, lots of little telescopes. Each of them looks at one star for as long as it can, waiting to see if it sees a tiny drop in brightness that could be another Earth. So the project that I did back then, uh, we actually... It's not, this is just a model and it ended up being very different than this, but we developed a little space telescope twice the size of this. So this is about the size of a loaf of bread, but much heavier. And we called it, uh, it ended up getting named Asteria. And it's a prototype for what would be one element of a giant constellation of hundreds of little satellites, each looking at their own star. That would be a lot cheaper, uh, but we'd have to get lucky for a transit. So now I'll move into what is my favorite topic, because I got sucked up into the planet Venus, which, yes, you have to love Venus, right? Because it's so bright in the night sky, sometimes in the morning sky. It's supposedly our sister planet, but unlike Earth, it's like a hellhole. It's so hot at the surface, too hot for life of any kind. But I'm not sure how much you have been following phosphine on Venus or the fact that there could be life in the clouds. But there's this whole concept that just like on Earth, if you hike up a mountain, it gets colder and colder. And so too on Venus, high above the surface in the clouds, the temperature is actually just right for life. So what I've been working on is nurturing this concept that there could be microbes, little bacteria type life in the cloud particles in Venus. 
and I have two separate things going on. One is I spent two, two or three years, I picked, I handpicked a team of people, uh, scientists and engineers to study what kind of missions should we send to Venus to look for life or signs of life. And we do have our first mission going to Venus. That's a bit, um, that's not exactly what I want to talk about right now, but one of the things about Venus is that in the clouds, it's still a terrible place for life. Mm. Even if the temperature is good, the clouds up there, they're not made of water droplets. They're made of acid, highly, highly toxic, horrible sulfuric acid. And until recently, people thought that this acid was essentially sterile, that it would kill like, I mean, it certainly would kill all earth type life but that it would kill, destroy like all, <laughs> all, um, all uh, complicated molecules. Mm. But part of our team has found that if they put like a tiny hydrocarbon molecule inside sulfuric acid, it actually sets off like a rich chain of chemistry leading to a lot of organic molecules. And I've gotten caught up in this as well and started to do some experiments of complicated molecules in sulfuric acid and it's absolutely breathtaking the work's not like mature enough to share but shocking really that wow maybe there's is life in the clouds not our life but other type of life made on other type of molecules and i guess the significance of that would mean that life can life can thrive in in some way in in very hostile environments but how do you think a discovery like that would be received on earth um because you think about, you know, are we alone in the universe? And you imagine, you always kind of imagine, if you're like me, something from Star Wars or Star Trek. And, and in reality, if we do discover life, it's probably going to be, you know, microbiological. How do you think, how do you think the world would react if we, you know, if we found there was microbial that. life in yeah. the, cloud, the clouds of Venus? <laughs> yeah, I understand it would be somewhat disappointing, but I want you to think about, this sort of very long journey, unfortunately, centuries long, you know, to find other intelligent life. Think about that. You yourself said we've only found exoplanets relatively recently. The fact that planets are out there is number one. Check. Hmm. We now know that rocky planets of the kind that could support life as we know it, those planets are very common. You know, next we want to find that water is common on exoplanets because water is needed for all life as we know it. Do you see what I'm saying? We're kind of building this step by step. If we can find that there is microbial life, other either on Venus or on an exoplanet indirectly, it's still it's not the same as finding the little green alien, but it's a step in the direction to say if life could exist elsewhere with a completely you know, unique origin, then surely that means life is everywhere. And then there's more hope that there are those intelligent civilizations out there somewhere. So I've, I, I've I was just trying to make you feel, I was just trying to make you feel a bit better about that. I, I'm ve I'm because, very excited about yeah. any of you know the prospects of any mm -hmm. life in the universe. But um, I had uh, Tom DeLong on the podcast who uh, uh, is a, is a bit of a UFO fanatic, and uh, I'm not going to ask you whether you think uh, there are aliens here on Earth, um, but I would like to ask you uh, uh, the big question, which is: Are we alone in the universe? And in your opinion? what do you think what alien life do you think is out there and when slash will we make contact with them um say in the next 50 to 100 years well i do think that i mean i do think there's life out there of some kind because the ingredients for life are everywhere like everywhere we look we see complex molecules even floating around in between stars we know that planets are incredibly common, but the reality that I face and other astronomers like me is just how limited we are and what we can explore. Mm. So we can study, you know, we get this big fancy space telescope. We could study the nearest 100 or maybe 1000 stars, sun-like stars. Mm. But remember our galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. This would be like saying, you know, you can meet everybody in your apartment block or on your street, but you've no way to meet people a few blocks away, the next town over, the next country. Mm. So really in my job, we're faced with this reality that we can only explore our very, very close by 
so-called solar neighborhood. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I've uh... so I do think there's life out there. Yeah, I do. Sorry, there's a little delay. Um, I've just finished the uh, the first part of the uh, the new Stranger Things series, and you're probably too busy uh, to watch Stranger Things. Um, but there, in in the show, there is a, an alternative dimension which exists in parallel to the human world. Have you given much or any thought to whether this is possible? Um, I'm just losing you here. I don't have your video and it says that you have a weak internet connection. Oh, it's okay. Sorry. It, it will it will come back. Um, sorry about that. I think it will come back. Did you hear me okay? Can you hear me, Ben? Oh, that's much better. Sorry about that. Um, I just lost you for a minute, and the message said that you had a weak internet connection. I don't know if oh, that's true or not. No, it's 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 where I live. Unfortunately, I can't get super fast internet, which is really annoying. Um, but don't worry if the video goes. Um, it should still just carry on. Um, so do you mind if we just pick up from where we were? Is that okay? Sure. You there were you asking about whether I believe there's life in the universe, and I said yes. But the challenge is we can only really probe very nearby. And I think it's the same true of intelligent civilizations. It's so hard to travel. We talked about getting to our nearest star with a robotic probe would take 20 years if mm. we can indeed figure out how to travel fast enough. Mm. Well, you, you're the author of uh, The Smallest Lights in the Universe, a memoir. Um, tell me about your book. Um, and, and at the end of this, I'll tell people how they can, uh, how they can read and get access to it. Sure. Well, my book is about the journey of exploration, about exploring outer space, like how I search for planets and try to think about how to find signs of life elsewhere. But my book is also about the journey of inner exploration because, you know, life is full of ups and downs and we can't help but be like shaped by our experiences. And the story is supposed to kind of give hope. It's the the book is supposed to inspire hope that, you know, if we hit rock bottom, we have the tiniest lights in the universe to help us get through it as well, that somewhere out there, there's other life and we're not alone. Are there, uh, are there any days where you question everything about the reality we find ourselves in and you think we're never going to know all the answers. It's just too complicated. Or do you find yourself impossibly optimistic that the answers are out there? I'm definitely an optimist and I believe the answers are out there. Some days if I get discouraged, it's only because the search will take us a very long time. So I do know that the search will continue, you know, even beyond my scientific career or our lifetimes, right? I mean, we want the answer now. We want to know if there's alien, there are intelligent aliens. We want to know if there's life out there. So if I get discouraged, it's never that we, it's never a thought that we won't find life or it's too hard. It's only that it will take a lot longer and we'll have to pass it down to the next set of generations. That's so inspiring. Um, just before you go, um, quite a lot of uh, young people um, studying science and engineering listen to this podcast. Um, if there's anyone listening to the podcast who wants to pursue a career chasing exoplanets and asking the big questions, are we alone in the universe? What would you recommend to them um, to, to follow? Well, I do have two key suggestions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do have two key suggestions. 
One is to find something you love doing that you're also very good at. So you might be very good at computer programming and there is a place for you. You might be very good at telescope observations. You might be very good at, you know, writing. And so find that niche that works for you, something you love doing that you're also very good at. The second thing is speaking more to people who want to become a scientist. It is very much an apprenticeship type of journey. So it's really important to find the right mentor. So if you're in high school or undergraduate, you want to try to get a summer job. They don't usually pay very well, but one that has an advisor who will you know, help nurture you along and show you the ropes. And the same goes through if you pursue later studies. So it's finding a topic and a skill that you love doing that you're also good at, and then it's connecting with the right people. That's fantastic. Sarah, it's been great to chat. Um, I'm very in inspired by everything that you're doing, and I look forward to uh, hearing more about your journey. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben, and good luck to you.